A man was walking through a cemetery and saw a headstone with the inscription, As I now am, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. A sarcastic jokester walking through the cemetery took out a piece of chalk. You remember the couplet that was inscribed on the headstone as, I now am, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. And the the jokester wrote underneath that, To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. The only reason that that is humorous to us at all, and laughing is not a rebuke, I told that intentionally as a joke, but the only reason that that is even remotely humorous to us is because we have lost sight of this simple Bible reality that when some people die, they do not go to heaven. As recently as this past Friday morning, preaching the homegoing service of a dear brother and faithful member of this church, Brother Joey Boyette, I said to that congregation of family and friends assembled here that according to the Bible, not only does not everyone go to heaven, according to the Bible, most people when they die, they do not go to heaven. Jesus said that there was a wide gate and a broad road that led to destruction and many would find that pathway to destruction. The Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would that all men would repent. The doctrinal truth is as plain as it can be. Notice this statement on the screen before you. People who never get saved go to hell when they die. This doctrinal truth has never been a popular doctrine and with good reason. People perhaps even in this room tonight who are lost and undone in their trespasses and sins, lost on their way to hell, do not generally like to be told that that's where they are headed for eternity. And if we're honest, far too many of God's people who are genuinely saved are uncomfortable, at times even seemingly ashamed of the simple, straightforward proclamation of our Lord that those who die without having repented of their sins shall perish in a place of eternal condemnation and just wrath from a holy and righteous God who in His blameless holy righteousness cannot allow sin into His presence. Our our own doctrinal statement, the Baptist faith and message, states our belief that Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. I do not apologize for the fact that this message is on my heart tonight, in part because this doctrinal truth has been on controversial display this past week, even among prominent pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention. In a podcast published this past week called the sword and the trowel, which I wholeheartedly commend to you. My friend, Dr. Tom Askell and his co-host, Jared Longshore, were addressing a recent controversy that involved Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. In that episode, Dr. Askell stated, and I quote, Kamala Harris is going to hell without Christ, and she thinks she's doing well. If they, he's referencing some others who had taken up her uh, 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 position, if they think what they are promoting is actually right, good, and true. The internet furor against this comment has been swift and strong. And again, that is to be expected from unregenerate people. Because the things of the Spirit of God cannot be discerned by the lost. But what is deeply, deeply troubling is the response from pastors including Southern Baptist pastors. One prominent Southern Baptist pastor tweeted, I strongly rebuke Tom Askell for saying this, and anybody who agrees with him. Madam Vice President Kamala Harris is a member of the Third Baptist Church in San Francisco, an NBC church, that is a a, a Northern Baptist Convention church, or National Baptist Convention, that ascribes to the NBC doctrinal statement almost identical to the BFM end quote of the tweet. As if being a member of a church is somehow evidence of conversion. Particularly for a politician whose policies are the most radical anti-Christian policies on abortion and the sanctity of human life and sexual perversion in the history of the United States of America. Frankly, that such a politician remains a member in good standing of an otherwise confessional church is a stark, sobering sign of the weakness of many churches in this country. Dr. Askell responded in an online article writing, I'm quoting him, I'm old enough to remember when such convictions were simply part and parcel of basic Christianity. 
But from the outcry that resulted from some Christian pastors, it is obvious that those days are gone. But here are the simple facts set forth in the Bible. Anybody who does not savingly trust Jesus Christ will go to hell. That's true, he writes, of Jake Tapper, Kamala Harris, Tom Askell, and any other sinner. Could I interject? And it would be true of Mike Stone. Anyone that does not savingly trust in Jesus Christ will go to hell when they die. Dr. Askell continues, today such convictions are narrow-minded and out of fashion with the more refined and sophisticated versions of Christianity that are so popular. When tone is more important than truth, You can be sure hell is a topic that is ruled out of bounds. But I believe in hell because of Jesus. End quote. And I agree. What does Jesus say about the eternal condemnation of the lost? He says it as bluntly as could be said, except ye repent. Ye shall all likewise perish. Now from this one verse, Luke 13 and verse Three, I I just want to put three simple truths on your heart. Why is it true that people without Christ die and spend eternity in a place called hell? First is because of the depravity of people. Years ago, the great G.K. Chesterton responded to an editorial question in the London Times. They had run a question on their editorial page, what's wrong with the world What's wrong with the world? And after a number of responses, the, uh, Brother Chesterton answered, Dear sirs, I am. G.K. Chesterton. You and I are what's wrong with the world because we are born into this world under the stain and the stamp of Adam's sin. We are born with a heart that is bent against God. We are born utterly depraved before God. I wanted you to consider tonight three things about that depravity and ask yourself, where do I fit in to this particular doctrinal truth? First, depravity extends itself universally. What we find in this text tonight, Jesus was talking to a good church-going crowd. He was talking to moral, upright people. People that would have been good neighbors. In fact, they were so so self-righteous that they had this idea that because some other people in their community had died in tragic construction accidents, they must have been worse sinners than were they. The, 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 The implication and thought in that time was that if difficulty came into your life, it must be because you're not right with God and because they died through these tragic, one a construction accident and one uh, they were murdered at the altar. Uh, 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 That we find, Pilate did that, we find that in verse one. And their thinking was surely because they died these tragic deaths, they must be worse sinners. And when Jesus says, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What he's saying is, do you think that that happened to them because they were worse sinners than other sinners? I'm telling you, they were not even worse sinners than you. We are all born into this world separated from God. Every father's child, every mother's baby, Romans 3, 23 says, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53, 6 declares that all we like sheep have gone astray and each one of us has turned to our own wicked way. Paul affirms this truth in Romans 3 beginning in the 10th verse and says, for there is none good. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 5, 12, the Bible says that sin entered into the world by one man. That, that man, of course, was named Adam. And death came in by way of sin. Paul is painting a picture uh, of, of Adam and Eve through their sin, propping open the door, so to speak, through their sin. And when sin propped open the door of humanity, death came in and entered into the human race. Sin entered the world by one man, and death came in by way of sin. And now death has spread to all men, for all have sinned. 
I've got bad news for you tonight. It is now 640. That means you are 40 minutes closer to death than you were when you walked in this room tonight. Nobody in this room has promised another week, not another day, not another hour, not one more moment. If you died tonight and they carried your cold, dead carcass out of this building, you'd be the first person to die in this church service, but you wouldn't be the first person to ever die at church. And if you're not saved, you will spend forever separated from God. No person on the planet has ever been untouched or untainted by sin except for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That means your boss, your co-worker, your parents, your spouse, your classmates, your kids. Listen me, Ma. Listen, Big Daddy. Your grandchildren, the ones that are the apple of your eye, you lay down your life for them. If they die lost in their sin, they will spend forever in hell. Jesus said, A-double-L, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Why? Because depravity extends extends itself universally. Secondly, depravity exhibits itself naturally. The master said, except ye repent. This depravity, as we discussed this morning, is the default setting of the heart. It has often been asked, what does a person have to do to die lost in their sin and go to hell? And the answer, listen, friend, is absolutely nothing. In fact, that's about the best way to make sure that that happens is to do nothing with this sermon tonight, to do nothing with the gospel, to do nothing with the Lord Jesus Christ, to spurn his blood, to turn your back on the offer of grace, to do nothing with the free offer of forgiveness from your sin. This depravity exhibits itself naturally. It starts down in the heart, but it does not stay there. Like spiritual cancer, it begins to eat its way from the inside to the outside. It makes its way up to the surface. And it comes out of the heart and and comes out through the hands. That's why given enough time, a lost person will touch things he ought not touch, take things he ought not take, and do what we ought not do. Depravity will make its way out of the heart and overflow from the mouth. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Vance Havner, the preacher of old, said, what's down in the well is coming up in the bucket. You got a problem with a filthy mouth, a gossiping tongue. You got a problem with, with, with profane language. It, it's not a tongue problem. You, you can literally have your tongue cut out, and you had not dealt with the problem. The tongue is just a symptom. The tongue is a window that, that allows us to gaze down into the blackness and the ugliness and the wickedness of an unconverted, unsaved heart. Depravity works its way out through the hands and through the mouth, and it comes to the surface and works its way out through the feet. And we go where we ought not go, and we stay where we ought not stay. And one lost person's feet may take her to the bedside of another woman's husband. His unsaved feet may take him to the bedside of another man's wife. The teenager's feet take them to places of rebellion where their parents don't even know and have not approved of them to be. This human depravity exhibits itself naturally. Hey, this is why you don't have to teach your children how to sin. They come into the world, as Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 3, by our very nature, children of wrath. Notice on the screen, the Bible says in Mark 7, 21, for from within, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, and adulteries. As I've already noted, hell is the default setting of the human soul. We come into this world with a heart that is bent and a fist that is clenched and raised against God. And that depravity extends itself universally. No one is left untouched. It exhibits itself naturally. If you just give it enough time, you'll see the manifestations of a lost soul. You say, well, I know someone that's lost and they don't act that bad. Well, the third thing you need to note is that depravity expresses itself differently. You see, the Bible describes this depravity as spiritual death. And you are either dead or you are alive. There's no middle ground. You can't be a little bit dead, ma'am, any more than you can be a little bit pregnant. You either are or you're not. Death is not a matter of degree. Death is a matter of fact. I'm going to say that again. Death is not a matter of degree. 
Death is a matter of fact. However, the manifestations of death are often matters of degree. Imagine for a moment three corpses, three men who have all died. One of them has been dead for five minutes, the other has been dead for five days, and the other has been dead for five years. They are going to be manifesting their death differently. But they are all equally dead. Spiritually, imagine three men. One is a good moral man, perhaps even a church member, maybe a member of the choir. He could be a Sunday school teacher or a deacon, perhaps even the pastor of a Southern Baptist church, but he does not know the Lord. The second man is a foul-mouthed, womanizing South Georgia redneck. The third man is a serial-killing rapist. The third man has manifested his dead condition more so than the second man who has manifested his dead condition more so than the first man, but they are all equally dead, all equally depraved, all equally doomed and destined for eternity without the Lord Jesus Christ, except they repent. This principle that death is not a matter of degree, but the manifestations of death are a matter of degree is perhaps not uh, uh, illustrated any better than to consider three people that Jesus Christ raised from the dead in his earthly ministry. Consider Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, and Lazarus. Jairus' daughter had been dead for a few moments. Mark 5 says that Jesus got there shortly after her death. In Luke 7, the widow of Nain's son was being carried out to the city cemetery. Perhaps he had been dead for a few hours. And according to John 11, Lazarus had been dead for four days. But they were all equally dead. The little girl's cheeks were still red and warm and rosy from the fever that had ultimately taken her life. The young man's body was cold and The darkness of of corruption perhaps had already begun to set in around the the sockets of his eyes. Lazarus' body had already gone by way of the canker worm and the maggot. You remember the sister said, don't move that stone out of the way. By now he's begun to rot. Behold, by now, Lord, he stinketh. But they were all equally dead. The little girl was in her bed. The young man was in his casket. Lazarus was in the tomb. But they were all equally dead. Only the immediate family members knew that the girl was dead. Everybody in the community knew that the young man was dead. Everybody in the entire countryside knew that Lazarus was dead, but they were all equally dead. You say, what does that mean? How does that apply spiritually, Brother Mike? Well, you may be a lost person that is respectfully dead like the little girl. You may be regrettably dead like the young man. You may be repulsively dead like old dead Lazarus, but dead is dead is dead is dead. And if you've never been saved, you are dead toward God, depraved in your lost condition, and destined for hell apart from giving your life to the Lord Jesus. The depravity of people. The second main truth I want you to note with me is the reality of punishment. The reality of punishment. As plainly as I could say it tonight, you cannot be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and not believe that lost people go to hell. There's no such thing as a genuine Christian that does not believe that lost people go to hell. Jesus said more about hell and judgment than he did any other subject. In fact, you'll notice that there are at least 162 references to hell in the New Testament. Seventy of them are spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Nearly one out of eight verses spoken by Jesus deals with the subject of hell. That's what Jesus is talking about when he said, I tell you the truth, except you repent. Hey, Emmanuel Baptist Church member, have you repented of your sin? I know you walked the aisle, went through the new members class, maybe you were baptized. Have you repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Jesus said, except you repent, you're going to perish. And that word perish speaks of eternal judgment and condemnation in hell. Three simple aspects of this truth I want you to note with me. Hell, first of all, is a literal place. 
Hell is the place where lost souls go to await final judgment. In fact, you could consider that hell is sort of like the county jail. It's the, it's the holding place while the condemned criminal waits on his final sentence in the lake of fire. Hell is a place where lost souls go to await final judgment. Jesus speaks of this place in the Olivet Discourse, which was a prophetic sermon that the Lord preached right before his death. Matthew 25, verse 41, the Savior said, Depart from me. This is what he's going to say to those that are lost. Depart from me. You cursed ones. I'm talking about people that were good neighbors, honest, moral friends, folks that wouldn't lie to you, steal from you, sleep with your wife, run off with your husband, but they died lost in their sin. And Jesus said, you are a cursed one. Depart from me into the eternal fire. Look at this word, prepared for the devil and his angels. That word prepared is an interesting word. You hear that word that that, that originally appears in the Greek of the New Testament, you hear that word quoted all the time. Although it's usually not from Matthew 25, 41, it's usually from John 14, 3. You hear it a lot at funeral services and at the graveside because Jesus said on the night before his death, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you so. And I'm going to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will indeed come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also look right here the same word that the master used to describe the preparation that had been made for the glorious place called heaven he uses the exact same word to describe a place that has been prepared for those who die in their sin I contend with you tonight theologically that it was never the plan of God for lost people to spend forever in hell. That's not why hell was prepared. The Bible says hell was prepared for the devil and for his angels. I believe it was Jerry Vines who spoke in this pulpit not many years ago. And he he, he had a sermon. He kept saying over and over again, you don't have to go to heaven and you don't have to go to hell, but you can't stay here. You're going to one of two places that the Lord has prepared An awesome place called heaven or an awful place called hell. You say, Brother Mike, if hell is a literal place, where is it? It's at the end of a life without Jesus. Matthew 7, 13, I referenced a moment ago. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. Now, although the language in that verse is figurative, it's describing a literal reality. There's a road and a gate. There's a pathway. There's a place that can be entered. Hell is a literal place. Consider also that hell is a loathsome place. Probably the strongest Greek word for hell in the New Testament is the word Gehenna. It's used 12 times in the New Testament, and 11 of the 12 come from the lips of our Lord. Gehenna was the garbage dump where fires And bodies would burn throughout the day. If you were a pauper and could not afford a funeral, they they generally just added your remains to to the city trash and carried you out to Gehenna. It was a place where there were worms and maggots and, and the fire burned forever and forever. In Luke 16, the Bible says that the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and was tormented by the flames. Five times Jesus Christ said that hell was a place where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you would ask me, Pastor, what exactly makes hell so loathsome? I don't know everything about hell, but I know enough about it to know that I don't want to go there. It's something like a garbage dump. It's something like a place where burning trash and dead bodies are consumed by by the flicker of the flames. It's something like fire. It's something like torment. It's something like a place where the worm and the maggot does not die. It's something like a place where there's never-ending weeping and never-ending gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like any place that I want to go. Many of us would love to have lakefront property. You don't want to be anywhere near the lake of fire. Hell is a literal place and a loathsome place. Also, hell is a lasting place. False teachers and Christian cults teach that hell and judgment are temporal passing realities. 
Some groups teach what is called soul annihilation. That is, you live and then you just die. One group teaches that spirits in hell will teach those in hell the, the, the gospel. They can repent and be resurrected to a higher degree of glory. That is, that you can in some manner or, or way be saved while you are in hell. But my question briefly is, what did the Lord Jesus say about the eternality of hell? He said quite a bit. In fact, our Lord said a lot about hell, and he used words and phrases like these you note on the screen. He called it fire. No, no, notice how many of these phrases have the connotation and the meaning of something that never ends. Fire, everlasting fire, eternal damnation, hellfire, damnation, damnation of hell, resurrection of damnation, furnace of fire, fire that is never quenched, torment. A place where their worm never dies, outer darkness and everlasting punishment. The other Bible writers pick up on this doctrinal truth. Jude 6 describes punishment as everlasting chains. Hebrews 6 2 mentions eternal judgment. Jude 7 describes eternal fire. 2 Peter 2 17 says darkness that is reserved forever and forever. Jude 13 speaks of a blackness that, that goes on forever and forever. And Revelation 14 speaks of a torment that goes on day and night forever and forever. The truth of the Bible is simple and clear. People who go to hell spend all of eternity in physical, emotional, and spiritual torment. You remember in Luke chapter 16, the rich man died and the beggar Lazarus also died. And the rich man opened up his eyes in torment and and Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man called out for some mercy. By the way, God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. And if you want mercy, you can have it. If you want grace, you can have it. If you want love, you can have it. Hey, friend, if you want compassion from God, you can have it. You want forgiveness of your sin, you can have it. You want escape from hell, you can have it. But you've got to have it while you're alive and breathing in this world. And he asked for some mercy. And Abraham said, you remember in your life you got good things and Lazarus got bad things, and, and there's a great gulf that is fixed between us. That, and, and he said, people who are where you are can never come over here to heaven, and people that are where Lazarus is and what we would call heaven, they can never be in any danger of going down to where you are. That is, when you breathe your last and Lazarus breathed his last, your eternal destiny was forever fixed and settled, and there will be absolutely no change about it. And that old man in hell began to cry out, if that's true, would you please send someone to my father's house? For I've got five brothers, and I don't want them to have to come here and suffer the way that I'm suffering. And that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching this message tonight, because the Bible teaches about the reality of hell, and people who die without being saved spend forever separated from God. And I've come tonight to tell you that you don't have to go to heaven, you don't have to go to hell, but you can't stay here. You can go to heaven by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. In this one little verse tonight, we read about the depravity of people, the reality of punishment, and finally and gloriously, the possibility of pardon. There's a very powerful word that we find here in this text. I don't know if you noticed it or not. I'll illustrate it by asking you to imagine that your child or your grandchild has been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. What a terrible piece of news something like that would be and the doctor says because of where the cancer is how large it is how deep it is within the brain there's absolutely nothing we can do there's there's no pill there's no radiation there's no chemo there's no surgery there's absolutely nothing that can be done except one thing you know what you'd be doing you'd be grabbing that doctor by his collar, and you'd pull him up close and personal, and you'd say, Doc, you better tell me what that thing is. And Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What a wonderful exception clause that you can repent and do not have to suffer the fate that waits a lost person when they die. Now, when Jesus speaks that word, except, 
except ye repent. There are three things that I want to quickly lay before you tonight. First is that the mind must be changed. The mind must be changed. This word repent is a Greek word metanoia. We've talked about this word before, metanoia. Noia references the mind. You, you're familiar with words like paranoia. And, and noia references the mind. That the, 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 the meta portion of that word means a change. You students are familiar with a metamorphosis, a change in form. The metanoia means a change in the mind. It is a change of mind that ultimately leads to a change of behavior. But, but because Jesus said, as a man thinks in his heart, what, what he is in his mind, so is he. So when the mind has been changed, the person has been changed. And as I regularly preach to you, that's why if you're truly born again, you can't say what you used to say and think what you used to think and do what you used to do because you're not what you used to be. Your mind, which is, is the, the, the real you, it has been transformed by the power of the gospel. Now, the verb tense that I have used here is vitally important. It's not that you make a decision tonight that you change your mind. It's that your mind is changed by the power of Almighty God. This is why if you've got a friend, a family member that's lost, you can beg and plead and you can cry and you can give the most polished, precise, what you think is a powerful gospel presentation and it rolls off of them like water off of a duck's back unless the Spirit of Almighty God is drawing them unto salvation through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's only the power of God Himself that can bring about this change in the mind. That's why in a few minutes we ought to flood these altars tonight and say, Spirit of the living God, would you change? change the mind and transform the heart of my lost friends, family members, neighbors, and co-workers. The mind must be changed except ye repent. Secondly, the Messiah must be confessed. You see, this word for repentance just doesn't merely mean turning from sin. Biblical repentance is turning from sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people that want to turn from their sin, but they just don't want to turn to Jesus. I'm talking about lost people who have enough simple common sense to be tired of the life that they're living. The, the drunkard who's tired of, getting, of, of waking up every Saturday morning or Sunday morning in the drunk tank down at the county jail. He, he's tired of the ruin that he's brought into his, his family. He, the, the, the womanizer who's tired of seeing his wife cry and hearing their children weep. The, 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 the thief that's, that's tired of getting arrested over and over again. The drug addict that's tired of a life that, that's lived with a bottle or a pill or a needle or some thrill. And they would give anything if someone would take them and turn them away from their sin. But far too often what they want to do is turn from their sin and just turn to themselves. But that's not salvation. That may be reformation. That may be self-will. That may be turning over a new leaf. That may be pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. But biblical salvation is when you turn from your sin and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you're my master, you're my Lord. I am tired of sin and straying, Lord, and that's why I'm coming home to you. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life, come into my heart and save me. Be my Lord and my master. Take up residence in my heart. And and I yield my life to you. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Master, the Messiah must be confessed. The mind must be changed. Thirdly and finally tonight, this for the people of God, the message must be conveyed. This is an exception clause we need to take to a lost and dying world. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. People often ask Bible preachers, how could a loving God send good people to hell? Bible students recognize that's a flawed question because there are no good people. The better question is how could a holy God allow sinful people to enter into heaven? 
Now I need you to pay very close attention as I close. Sit very still and listen. How can a holy God allow sinful people into heaven? He cannot. He can allow people who have committed sins into heaven. But something's got to be done about that sin. Habakkuk 1.13 says that God's eyes are so holy that he cannot look upon sin with favor. It's not that God in his holiness cannot look upon sin. He can look upon sin. He sees every bit of it. That's really the problem. Saw it all. Knows about all of it. And there's not a person in this room tonight that would want our private moments, our private thoughts, and our unseen actions played out on the video screen tonight. I'd be the first one to crawl out under the crack underneath that back door. But God in His holiness cannot look upon sin with favor. When God sees sin, He's got to do something about it. And the only way that you can get into heaven is you've got to ask God to forgive you of your sin. But God doesn't overlook your sin. Here's how you get saved. God the Father in His mercy and grace takes your sin and places it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the sin is paid for. It can be paid for tonight by Jesus. And you can leave this place tonight singing, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. That's the message that this congregation needs to go out and communicate and convey to a lost world in their sin. That you can be forgiven. You can be saved. You can be reconciled to God, but except unless you repent... You're going to perish. The story is said of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher who focused a lot on the sovereignty of God in salvation, who was not given over to gimmicks or pragmatism in salvation, once said that if the chosen elect of God were marked out with a red X on their back, I'd walk the streets of London lifting up shirt tails. But since they're not, I'll walk the streets of this city declaring, whosoever will, let him come. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, in brief conclusion, there are two groups in this room tonight. Let me talk first to the people that you say, I know that I'm saved do you have anybody in your life that you, that you know is lost? Except they repent. Turn to Christ and become saved. They're going to die lost in their sin and spend forever separated from God in hell. I wonder tonight, would you be moved enough to just find a place to pray right there where you are, or maybe at this public altar? There's a second group in this room tonight. I'm confident of this. Hundreds of people in this room, no telling how many watching online. You may be a member of the church, a good person. You may be a good parent. You may be a grandparent. But you've never bowed your heart and bent your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I've come tonight to tell you, if you want to be saved tonight, you can be saved. For anybody that calls on the name of the Lord in repentant, believing faith can be forgiven and can be saved. Tonight, I invite you, come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ and be saved.